I'll invite you to turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. <clears throat> it says, by him, therefore, and it's talking about the fact that we're looking for a, uh, an eternal home in heaven. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Notice the Bible tells us that there's something that we uh, are, uh, something that we need to incorporate into our Christian lives and our walk of faith. He's talking about giving thanks to God, a sacrifice of praise, continually. Well, continually means never ending, doesn't it? We should live a life of praise to such a degree that no matter whatever else is going on in our lives, no matter what attack we might be under or what discomfort or circumstances, unpleasant circumstances that we might encounter, we are supposed to live a life where the fruit of our lips is praise unto God no matter what. Now, a sacrifice is something that you present in service to God. You may remember in, Ro in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is holy and acceptable unto God. It talks about that sacrifice, offering our bodies to the service of the Lord as being a part of worshiping Him in spirit. What it means to worship in spirit really means to offer your body as a living sacrifice. Well, what does that mean? We all understand that that's talking about not going by the desires of our flesh, not letting the, the situations or the circumstances of this earthly life dictate to us whether we're up or whether we're down, whether we feel like God is close or whether we feel like He's too far away to find, but instead to offer ourselves in service to God to live according to what his word says rather than how we see it, things around us or how we feel. Now, I want you to look with me also to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul writing to Timothy, who's pastoring the church at Ephesus at the time. Notice verse 1, he said, I exhort therefore that first of all, he's saying put first things first, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Then he tells us part of who the all men. He's talking about those that are kings and in authority and so forth. But notice verse 1. It gives us five elements of what our prayer life should be made up of. Supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. Now we could take a lot of time and talk about supplications and prayers and intercessions. But the part I want you to see is that an equal part or equal to our request that we make to God, our prayer life should include giving a thanks to the same measure to the same degree. And even more so in many cases, for example, intercession is, making, uh, is joining the gap between God and somebody that's unsaved. The reason that intercessions is always concerning the unsaved is because once God, once Jesus is accepted in the heart, of a believer, there's no separation from God. There's nothing to join together. Well, you can't give yourself intercession. You can start off and pray and attempt to intercede with your own understanding, but if the Holy Ghost doesn't hook up with you and take hold with you, there's no further, that's as far as you can go. You can't take intercessions any further. So a healthy prayer life, if I'm reading this right, a healthy prayer life should include all four elements. Supplications. Now you can make supplication for yourself and other, uh, other believers. Prayers. That's a general term that's talking about communication with God. Intercession, which I said is joining together by the work of the Holy Ghost, God and an unbeliever in prayer. And then finally, giving of thanks. Giving of thanks. Now, there are several examples, and I'm, I'm sure you're aware of this. There aren't many that, that spell it out so clearly, but there are two examples in the Bible, at least two examples in the Bible, that shows us how praise 
should be incorporated into our prayer life and into our Christian walk. One's in the Old Testament and one's in the New Testament. Let's look at the Old Testament first, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I love this story. This is one of the all-time great accounts of God taking care of his people. Let's start in verse 1. It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them others beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side of Syria. And behold, they are in a certain place, I don't know how to pronounce that, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, he's facing a great trial, he's facing a great attack. These armies are gathered against him and there's no military might that they have. There's not a chance that they could defeat the other armies. They're going to be swept over and, and conquered by these people, these enemies of Israel, unless God intervenes. I love this prayer that Jehoshaphat prayed. He said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And rulest thou not over all the kingdoms of the heathen? Aren't you bigger than them? And in thy hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee? Couldn't you do something about them here, Father? Are you not our God, verse 7, who did drive out the inhabitants of this land, talking about the promised land, before thy people Israel and gave it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? Aren't you the one that did that? And they dwelt therein and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name's sake. If when evil comes upon us as the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. Now, folks, I want you to realize what he's doing. He's reminding God of what God promised. When God brought the children of Israel into the promised land, when they built the temple at the direction of God during Solomon's days, The place where God placed his name, it meant something. It meant something to God and it meant something to Israel. God made a promise. Now remember, as we say so often, God never changes. If this is what God was like in the Old Testament, then it has to be what he's like now. And if God made provisions for Israel to get help in the middle of a crisis or in the middle of attack, but he didn't make the same solution available to us if he didn't give us the same opportunities to enlist his help and his aid against the things that are coming against us and the attacks that we're undergoing then that makes him a respecter of persons yet the bible says he is no respecter of persons well that's either true or it's a lie one way or the other can't be both Thank God it's one way, and that is God never changes. Israel is crying out to God just like God said they should do when they're under attack. So we could say they're praying the word. We could say they're enlisting God's help by putting him in remembrance of what he said. The first part of this prayer one of the things I like about it is that Jehoshaphat doesn't start off talking about the problems they're having. He certainly doesn't beg God, but he speaks to God in a way that sounds like he's almost surprised that we're even having to go through this. God, aren't you stronger than these people? Aren't you the one in charge on behalf of your people, Israel? That doesn't mean he controls everything. But he certainly promised Israel victory over their enemies. So it's almost like what a pain this is to, to even be having to tell you about this. 
Then he says, but didn't you tell us that when we faced difficulty and problems? Now, notice what the conditions were that he said that Israel should call upon him that he would help. Verse 9 again, if when evil comes upon us as the sword, well, that's what they're facing that's this time, or judgment, or pestilence, or famine. In other words, it's deliverance from God. God has promised deliverance from them, for them from a number of things. Pestilence would be sickness and disease or a plague. Famine, we know what famine is. That means there's not enough food to take care of the people, or to feed everybody. God said he'd help, help them in those conditions or in those circumstances. God, didn't you say when these things come against us and we stand before this house and in your presence and cry unto you in our affliction, then you will hear and help? Didn't you make that promise to us? Well, they know it, but they're putting God in remembrance. Now, folks, if we jump ahead and just identify that God did help them and God did deliver these enemies into their hands and utterly defeat the enemies without Israel even having to throw a rock, If we jump ahead to recognize that, then we would have to understand and conclude that God didn't mind them praying in this manner. I know some people, when you talk about things in this manner and the, the way that they prayed and put it in a, a present-day context where we put God in remembrance of his word, that freaks a lot of Christians out. They come across with the idea that we're being arrogant trying to demand something of God. Well, if you just look at the verses of Scripture that we just read, God is saying when you come into these circumstances or when this evil comes against you, whether it's enemies or pestilence or famine or whatever it is, call unto me, I will help you. So the very fact that God does bring them aid and deliver them from the hand of their enemies shows that this is an effective way to pray. No matter how somebody might feel about it, this kind of praying works. Now, again, if it only works for Israel but doesn't work for us, then God's a respecter of persons, and the Bible is a lie. And that's the very reason the Holy Ghost saved us this story, is so we would know what the principles are that will make this kind of praying work for us just like it worked for them. Thank God it does work. Verse 10, and now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Jehoshaphat's getting really plain with the Lord again. He said, the only reason we've got these people to deal with is you wouldn't let us destroy them early on. Behold, I, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. They didn't even call the land theirs. They said, this belongs to you. You gave it to us as an inheritance, but this land is yours. Now look at what the people are doing. Folks, if we would look at the things that Jesus purchased for us as belonging to God, forgiveness of sin, redemption from spiritual death, Deliverance from poverty. Healing of our physical bodies. If we would recognize that, that's belong, that those things belong to God, that that's God's territory that he gave us to inherit. Sure, it belongs to us because it's our inheritance. But when the devil comes and tries to steal it from us, it's good to remember that it belongs to God. And God defends his territory. Behold how I say, or behold I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession which thou hast given us to inherit. O oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? Are you not going to do something about this, Lord? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Folks, you don't have to know everything to get an answer from God. There's a lot of things they don't know they don't know what, to, what step to take, which indicates if they did know what step to take, they would have already taken it. But there comes a point 
and a place. Paul wrote about this to the Ephesians where he talked about having done all to stand, stand. There comes a point where you've done everything you know to do. Well, what do we do now? You stand. You refuse to be moved. You hold your ground based on the word of God, based on his promises to help you and deliver you. And you stand. Now we'll look at what standing looks like. Verse 13, And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeel, the son of Madanah, a Levite of the sons of Asap, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Can I ask you a question? Is this what God would have done in any way? If Jehoshaphat had heard about the enemies that were arrayed against him, planning their attack, so to speak, would God have just protected them anyway? We don't have any indication that he would have. There are some places in the Bible that are quite puzzling to people. And if you don't understand the, the character and the nature of God and how he, the system that he established, it's easy to get the wrong idea about him. For example, the Bible tells us <clears throat> that there was one case where Jesus was in the ship with the uh, disciples and a great storm of wind arose and they woke him up to tell him about what was going on. He rebuked the wind and the storm and everything became calm. But then there's another story about when the disciples were by themselves in the midst of the Sea of Galilee. And they were in the middle of a giant storm, just like they had been before. And Jesus comes walking on the water, and the Bible said that he would have passed them by if they hadn't cried out to him. He would have passed them by. But they saw him and cried out to him. And he came over and helped them. This time he didn't calm the storm as much as instantly they were on the other side. The Bible indicates to us time and time again that God will sit by and let things happen unless we call him. Unless we seek his face and act in obedience to what his word says to get his results or his deliverance. So the Spirit of the Lord came upon this guy. In times like that, I'm sure it would have been good for God to use somebody that's proven. I wouldn't want just anybody to be the one delivering the message from God. <clears throat> Don't be afraid. The battle's not yours, <clears throat> but it's God's. I would trust that from somebody that has a position that's been proven a lot more than somebody that I didn't know, wouldn't you? But apparently, giving us the lineage of this guy, apparently that's an indication to us that he is proven and that the people could trust what he said was God speaking to the people. He continues in verse 16, Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand you still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. This is what standing looks like. And that was the specific instruction that he gave to the people, that the Holy Ghost gave through this prophet. He tells them where to go. He tells them what position to place themselves in. And then he says, stand. Standing can be a real uncomfortable place. Because it's human nature to think that we help ourselves or should help ourselves by actively doing something. 
The folks standing is doing something. Standing is taking God at his word and looking for his promises to be fulfilled. Standing is doing something. And it releases a spiritual force that no physical force or no physical effort or no physical strength can compare with. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. In other words, they're thanking him for what he's told them. They're thanking him for what he has just declared that he will do. They're thanking him for the victory. They don't see it yet. It hasn't occurred yet. It's not a physical reality for them. But as far as God's concerned, it's done. And the people worship the Lord for that. You could say that this is a sacrifice of praise since the enemy's still out there. When the children of Israel shouted, when they were encircling the city of Jericho, God's instruction for them was to shout while the wall was up. Now, when the wall comes down, everybody's ready to shout then. And too many times, Christians are waiting to see the results before they thank God for what he's promised. And that's entirely backwards to the way it's supposed to work. So they're worshiping the Lord because of the victory and the deliverance that God has said is theirs. And the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korhites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. They're not praising God because the enemy is defeated. They're praising God because of his promise of deliverance. And that praise, that sacrifice of praise that's being offered unto God, as far as God is concerned, the work is already done. So when the people start praising God for the work and the promise, for the word and the promise that God has made, they're indicating that as far as they're concerned, it's done too. Now, we know physically it's not done. But as far as they're concerned and as far as God's concerned, it's already done. Folks, if we don't start looking at the life that we're living and the things that come against us and the work of the devil that tries to stop us, if we don't look at things the same way, we can't be on the same page with God. In fact, the thing that gets us on the same page with God is when we give thanks, again, sacrifice of praise if necessary, because of what God's Word promises. That's how you get on God's page. And unless God can get you on the same page with Himself, He can't bring about the results. The Bible says in Romans chapter 4, verse 20, it says, Abraham was strong in giving glory to God. He was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Strong faith praises God for the answer before it sees the answer. Strong faith praises God because of the word, not because of what they see. But strong faith brings the word of God and the deliverance promised by that word into physical reality in our lives. So here's Israel praising God for the answer. You told us, God, if we came to this place and cried out unto you, you'd hear us and help us. You've spoken to us. You've told us what's going to happen. So now we're offering you praise and thanksgiving. We're worshiping you. All of those terms, I think, are interchangeable in this setting and in this story. And so they're praising God because of the work being done already. By faith. Verse 20, and as they rose up early in the morning, they went into the wilderness of Tekoa, and as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. He encourages the people to believe that God's big enough to do what he said. He encourages, encourages the people to believe in the word that was spoken through Jehaziel. Verse 21, 
And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord and that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. Now, let me ask you something. How does Jehoshaphat know that the key to this thing is going to be put the praisers out front? See, there are only a couple of times, as I mentioned, there are only a couple of real specific places that identifies prayer and pray together, bringing about the victory. But Jehoshaphat seemed to know how it worked. Jehoshaphat didn't falter. He didn't wake up the next morning and say, okay, well, we had a good meeting yesterday. We may not feel the same today, but let's go back to the Lord and see what he'd have us to do. He seemed to recognize the importance of praise and worship even before the enemy has been dealt with. So he appoints praisers. It tells us what they said. Praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. Verse 22, and when they began to sing into praise, when they began to sing into praise, when they began to sing into praise. Now, folks, why didn't this happen the day before when they worshiped God for the answer and the things that he said through Jehaziel? God could have destroyed the people that the day before, and Israel wouldn't have known it. But this idea of praising God for the answers that you don't yet see, this seems to be a continuous thing, at least in Jehoshaphat's understanding. If that weren't the case, why would he put praisers and singers out front? And when they began to sing into praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. When I think about this, I realize that there had to be two left, two people left. I mean, eventually it comes down to just two people left in the field. And they kill each other with their last blow. Because nobody escaped. God didn't leave one straggler behind. The enemies of Israel were utterly and completely destroyed. Bible says that when they came upon them, it took them, there were so many jewels and, and spoils and so forth that it took them three whole days to carry everything off. So what started off as the people of God facing one of the greatest tests and trials and troubles in their history ended up with the people being multiplied many times over. Let's look at the other example over in Acts chapter 16. The first part of the chapter tells us about how God supernaturally led Paul and Barnabas. I'm sorry, Paul and Silas on this trip, I guess. They were trying to find out which way the Lord wanted them to go, and there were uh, plans that they made, attempts that they made to go into certain territories, and the Holy Ghost stopped them from going that way. Finally, there was a vision in the night where a man from Macedonia was saying, come over here and help us. So the next morning, Paul related that to his company, those traveling with him, And they all agreed that this has to be the way that we want to go. This has to be where the Lord is taking us and leading us into Macedonia. So when they get to Macedonia, they made their way over to Philippi, which the Bible says was the chief city of Macedonia. So they're in Philippi here in this certain place. Verse 16, it says, And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying or fortune-telling. The same followed Paul and us, 
Luke is part of the company, so he's writing it first person or from a first person perspective. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Well, that's true. Even the devil knew what, what, uh, why they were there. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. So this is happening day after day after day for many days. I don't know what many is. You make your own estimate on that. But there comes a certain point in time where the Holy Ghost prompts Paul to do something about it. Now, why didn't he do something about it the first day? Even though the advertisement is true, who wants the devil advertising for him? Why didn't Paul do something about it the first day? Because he wasn't empowered by the Holy Ghost to do it until he was grieved in his heart. That grieving in his heart is another way of saying the Holy Ghost anointed him to do something about it. So he did. He said, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, talking to the spirit that possessed this little girl, and he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. This is the place that God sent them to supernaturally by a vision. Verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Now, folks, if you were either Paul or Silas, what would you be praying about at that time? I'd be praying for God to get me out of there. I'd be making my case before the Lord. Lord, we came where you told us to go. We've done what you told us to do. We wanted to go into Asia. We wanted to go to Mysia. And then we wanted to go into Bithynia. But you said no to those. You brought us here. They knew beyond a shadow of a doubt they were in the will of God. God had confirmed that to them supernaturally. Well, even more than that, he confirmed it to them spectacularly. We don't have any other case where Paul was directed by somebody in a vision on where to go. But he was here. Folks, following God doesn't mean he's giving you the easiest road. Sometimes, especially when accompanied by a spectacular means of direction like Paul had in this case, the vision in the night. Oftentimes that means there is rough sailing ahead. And God knows that we sometimes need these spectacular moves or direction given because of the rough times that are ahead of us. I wonder how steady Paul and Silas would have stayed if they hadn't had a vision to come to Philippi. They just somehow happened up on this case. I'm not sure it would have had the same effect. But here it shows us what Paul and Silas, who knew God better than anybody else, in that place and at that time, here's what they knew was the answer. At midnight they prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Sounds like they know something like Jehoshaphat knew something in the Old Testament. Oh, that we would learn from their lesson. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Folks, I believe that's as supernatural as anything else about that story. Because not only was Paul and Silas 
released from the chains that they were being held by. Their hands and the feet, their hands and feet that were in the stocks, those stocks must have been obliterated some way or another to provide deliverance and escape for them. But there are other people in that prison too. And something about what they heard, where it says the prisoners heard them, that tells us there were other prisoners. And here where it says the prisoners heard them, there was something about what Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God about. He must have, they must have said enough for the prisoners to understand that it was God and only God that caused this earthquake. So rather than everybody running out, everybody that's now been freed, the prison doors were open, they're sitting still waiting to see what Paul and Silas do next. They recognized that this was not just some freak earthquake that happened. You wouldn't expect an earthquake just to open prison doors and cause chains and stocks to release people. And they knew that. So nobody moved. That's an indication to me that what the prisoners heard identified God as the source of their deliverance. When Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, they had to have said enough out loud where the other prisoners could hear them to identify that they're looking for God for deliverance. And when this earthquake comes and brings the deliverance, nobody moves a peg. So the jailer calls for a light and springs in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what's my, what must I do to be saved? Apparently he heard enough before he fell asleep to identify that they're praying and singing praises unto God. And his first question is about salvation. Now we don't have any indication that Paul and Silas have been preaching to the prisoners in, in jail. But the jailer has heard enough in some way or another to realize that there's salvation available from the God that just opened everybody's prison door. So he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and baptized and was baptized, he and all of his family, straightway. And when he brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all of his house. Now turn with me over to Philippians chapter 4. Paul writes to the church at Philippi the same city where these things have just occurred. And Paul in his letter to them gives them instruction on how to handle difficult situations. What does their Christian life look like? Well, Paul says it should look like this. Verse 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. I wonder if that carried any weight with the Philippians. Paul's first experience there. How that he was thrown in jail. How that he and Silas prayed unto God at midnight and sang praises unto God and there was an earthquake that God brought about to free everybody in the place. Let's read it again. It says, be careful for nothing. Another translation says, don't be anxious or don't fret about anything. But in everything, in everything, pleasant things, unpleasant things, victories or attacks, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Paul says, here's the answer to getting results from God. Make supplication, pray. Pray that in the children of Judah and it works for you and me you may remember the story of Dr. Yeomans Dr. Lillian B. Yeomans she was a medical doctor that 
inadvertently got she couldn't do anything lost her livelihood and she came to the place where there was nothing that medical science could do for her but she got healed by the power of God and then that sent her on a quest and she devoured the word and she and her sister her sister was a, a medical doctor as well she and her sister set up these healing houses or homes. Uh, well, I, I said that like there was more than one. They just used the big house that they had for, for that purpose. And there was a lady for people with conditions that were beyond medical help. And there was a lady that was in this individually with each individual person in, in their home. And they'd read Galatians chapter 3 and Deuteronomy chapter 28. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles and that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. In night with every person. And there was one lady that was in the, that had just recently been moved in to their healing rooms or healing home. And this woman had a vision. And in this vision, she saw two giants. The side that was loaded down, it said prayers. On the other side will be yours. So she started off praising God. She told other people about the vision she had had and what the Lord had spoken to her. And so beginning every day, she just started praising the Lord, saying these little sing-song things, not really singing hymns or songs or whatever, just pray. I ever knew what the condition was that she had, but it was a terrible condition. And so here she is. She's just singing these little sing-song things about, you know, for several days, not quite a week, I don't think, but several days. And she had another vision. And this time the vision wasn't, down on the side of prayers and up on the side of praises, this time they evened out. And the power of God hit her and she was healed from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. She jumped out of bed when into every or other people in the house that were healed at the same time she was because they had heard her singing and picked it up themselves. There's another story, Brother Hagee, end of his ministry, something that had happened that had taught him a great deal about God and ministering to people and so forth. He was holding a revival in a certain church, pretty large church, and the pastor had been called away in an emergency situation, and so the, the pastor was high. But there was somebody that was part of the church that had some kind of condition that would cause uh, epilepsy gathered this young minister and several of the deacons or elders from the church and they went over to the house where this person was sick and when they got there one of these seizures began and so the young minister everybody looked to him because he's the only ordained minister in the group and so everybody looked to him he said I did everything I knew to do I prayed I cast the devil out whatsoever so he said finally I just stopped doing what I was doing it wasn't working and after a few moments this, this seizure still she just started singing about Jesus again it wasn't some song that everybody else knew it was just a little sing song type of thing where she's magnifying the Lord well one by one the minister said one by one we all started singing. all of a sudden one of these seizures began again so the young minister said, I went back to what I tried the first time. I laid hands on them. I declared their healing. I tried to cast the devil out. Finally got to the end of what I knew to do. So I just stopped. Nobody else knew what to do either. So the pastor's wife started up with this little sing-song thing about Jesus again. And when they all wind up picking up on and it never returned again. This minister said, I've incorporated that into my ministry, incorporated that method into his ministry with great success. 
he would declare the word, claim the healing for the person, the individual, and then just start singing to Jesus, thanking him for his goodness and his deliverance. In that case, for his healing mercy. And when they sang praises unto God. I wonder how many people, after all, the Bible says we're not heard for our much speaking. The things that moves God is faith, not the abundance of words. Lift your hands and thank him for his goodness. Lord, we magnify your holy name. We worship you. Jesus, we give you an offer no matter how we feel. We yield to your word. We declare that your word is true. And so we, give, we sing praises to your name. We glorify you. Thank you, Father, that we're not under the curse. For, for Jesus, since Jesus ransomed me. Lord, we magnify you. We worship you, Jesus. Bless you name of the Lord have the answer no matter what circumstances or symptoms are in our flesh it's good to have the answer and to know that you're on our side we say we're healed because we're healed thank you